Welcome CEHA members and everyone attending today as part of the ANA's Global Day of Learning. It's so exciting to be here with you, 5,000 marketers from 70 countries. I'm Fiona Carter, CMO of Goldman Sachs and co-chair of CEHA. At CEHA, our mission is clear, to drive the accurate portrayal of women and girls in marketing and media. As marketers, we tell stories every day through the content and messaging we create. How we portray women and girls matters and has been proven to be good for society and good for business. In fact, research proves that accurate portrayals of women and girls in ads and programming increases brand reputation plus 56%, improves call to action plus 20%, and increases business ROI by two to five X. I'm proud to say that I have been involved with the See Her team from early days. If you're new to See Her, you'll quickly discover the sense of responsibility that unifies our members. We are all champions of gender equality, but for us being a See Her champion means this. Using our voices to advocate on this critical issue is simply the first step. Our superpower is our focus on actively working to drive meaningful change. Through our brands, our people, and our marketing, we step up, we lead the way, and we continuously seek to make positive impact. What does that impact look like at Goldman Sachs, you might ask? Well, we start with our business practices. We know from our experience in advising corporations that companies with diverse leadership perform better. Our own board is two thirds diverse. So since 2020, we will not take a company in the US and Europe public without having two diverse board members, one of whom must be a woman. Year to date, we've taken 180 companies public under these guidelines. We've used our access to talent to recommend and place onto corporate boards over two dozen diverse candidates, 40% of whom are women of color. At Goldman Sachs, perhaps the greatest value we can add is aligning our intellectual capital with providing access to financial capital. In 1999, we published the Womenomics research, which demonstrated that women's economic advancement will improve the economy as a whole. With our 10,000 women and 10,000 small business programs, we have helped over 100,000 women entrepreneurs by providing a rigorous business education program, access to capital, and ongoing opportunities for networking. To date, the Goldman Sachs Foundation has committed over 150 million to this program. And this year, we launched our 1 million Black Women Initiative, built on the principle that narrowing the opportunity gaps for Black women will in turn narrow opportunity gaps for all and drive economic progress for the country as a whole. Launched in partnership with Black women-led organizations, the $10 billion commitment in direct investment capital and $10 million investment in philanthropic capital is the largest investment ever focused on uplifting Black women at every stage of their lives. Closer to home in marketing, as the first CMO at Goldman Sachs, I have made See Her a priority for our marketing teams. Our action plan is drawn from CHER's marketing toolkit and the ANA Growth Council's society and sustainability agenda. Beyond the accurate portrayal of women, girls, and all people in our creative, and I am pleased to say that every ad measured this year is above the norm of 100, but we also aspire to equal representation in our media and marketing supply chain, and we plan to reset any investment inequalities in our marketing spend. First step is to draw up a scorecard. We're setting the baseline with a full audit of data and we're working on representation goals. And we are moving to make this a systemic way of doing business. For example, we're currently running a creative pitch and have integrated these priorities as success criteria in the RFP. The only way forward is for every team member to feel responsible, and I can already see the behavior changing as we make different choices about where to spend and who to work with. Today, you will hear from my fellow See Her champions on how we're working across the global media landscape, how we're developing new approaches to reach next gen, and how we are benchmarking progress in sports and music where women are underrepresented, under celebrated, and underpaid. 
borrow and steal every idea you can and take it back to your teams because this is where change starts. And when I think of change makers and champions, there is no greater of all time than Mark Pritchard, my fellow co-chair, my fellow co-conspirator, whose polite but determined commitment to gender equality drives us all. Mark? Thank you, Fiona. It's so inspiring to work alongside you, to see her founders and see her team, and to hear about the work you're doing at Goldman Sachs and that see her is doing around the world. As we all know, images and narratives have power. And today you'll see several examples of trailblazers who are changing images and narratives across the advertising, media, and content ecosystem. Because by bringing stories to the screen, all screens, more people can feel seen and feel less isolated. And we can change how we see ourselves, how we see each other, and how we see the world at a global and a local level. That's why we're so committed at See Her to ensure that the characters we create and the messages we convey in our ads and programming always accurately represent real people and real stories across gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, ability, religion, body type, and age. Those stories have the power to connect us and unite us, to eliminate bias, to promote equality, and to drive inclusion. We are the marketing community. We have broad reach, connecting with billions of people every day. And with that broad reach comes broad responsibility, which requires us to use our voices as a force for good and to keep learning and refining our capabilities to fulfill that obligation. That's where Seher comes in. For example, we've refined our gender equality measure or gem testing to reflect multicultural inclusion to help us accurately portray people through an intersectional lens. We've expanded Seher across sports with a gem scorecard and across music with the accelerator program that supports the discovery and elevation of women's voices because sports and music are universal passion points that shape culture and shape perceptions. We've dug deeper with the hashtag Write Her Right program to ensure an inclusive and intersectional approach in how stories are told. And we've committed to education, including multiple research collaborations, along with Next Generation See Her training and See Her education programs for your companies. We bring tangible ways for marketers to make systemic change in your organizations. If you're not a member, join us. The benefits are immense. The value is huge. Just the use of GEM alone, the global gold standard for measuring the accurate portrayal and bias in content, is worth its weight in gold. I remember vividly when P&G first received GEM scores across our brands five years ago, and it was a game changer. We've never looked at advertising, media, or content the same. And three years ago, we set an ambition to have 100% of our ads score 100 or better on GEM. We were at 62% then, and we're now at 82%. Not where we want to be yet, but making progress. And we're not only eliminating bias, our brands are also growing sales because accurate portrayal is good for business. Now there's one more point to consider. We need to not only see her, but to support her. With the pandemic, racial and social unrest, economic challenges, climate change, and political upheaval, the real challenges women face are escalating, and the progress that women and girls have made is at great risk. These events have negatively affected women and girls disproportionately around the world. Most recently, gender equality could be set back 200 years in Afghanistan alone, according to the Afghan Women's Network. As the leading movement for gender equality in advertising and media, it's important for See Her to have a conversation about this situation with this audience around the world and to identify how we can not only see her, but support her. To provide a compelling point of view, we invite renowned journalist, author, see her board advisor, passionate advocate, and amazing human being, Katie Couric, to lead this important discussion. Thank you. And now Katie, over to you. Mark, thank you so much for that kind introduction. You've been such a leader 
not only for women, but for humanity, I think, in every aspect. You know, we wanted to spend a little time talking with everyone who's gathered here today. We're at a critical juncture where we've seen much of the progress we've made in recent decades erode before our eyes in a variety of areas. When it comes to the pandemic, the first year of this global pandemic knocked, knocked 54 million women around the world out of the workforce. And you can only imagine the repercussions that's happening in every aspect of society. The pandemic, in fact, has set back gender equality by a full generation, according to the World Economic Forum. So the pandemic is providing a backdrop for a lot of the steps back that we're seeing for women and then you look at what's happening in states like Texas. At least 80% of women seeking an abortion will no longer have access to care in Texas. It also suffers from a dire maternal mortality crisis, a critical issue that I've explored in a two-part podcast in my podcast series, Next Question, which I encourage you all to listen to. The U.S. holds the highest maternal death rate in the developed world, Texas maternal mortality rate is above even the U.S. average. Black women in Texas are disproportionately affected, accounting for 11% of live births, but 31% of maternal deaths. And of course, then we move to Afghanistan, the heartbreaking images that we all witnessed. All these girls and women left once again to at the mercy of the Taliban. In July, the UN reported the number of women and girls killed and injured in the first six months of the year nearly doubled compared to the same period the year before. And this was before the US exited. I recently had a conversation with an amazing photojournalist named Lindsay Adario about the situation in Afghanistan. She's been covering it for years. And here's her heartbreaking account of what's happened and is happening now. I first started covering Afghanistan when it was under the Taliban, and I really didn't know what to expect. As a, an American woman, I needed a guide, a male guardian, to sort of take me around, and photography was illegal. I was able to link up with UNHCR, and they ushered me around the country. I went to Ghazni, Logar, Wardak, Nangahar, and Kabul. And really, it was astonishing. I had never been to a place like that where women had almost no rights. Every form of entertainment for both men and women was illegal. There was no television, no music, no films. Women and men who were not blood relatives were not allowed to meet, and it was just really oppressive. Women lived in fear that if their voices were heard while they were speaking, while walking down the streets, if they did leave the house, that they would be beaten. Many women were beaten because their burqa wasn't long enough, or they might have a strand of hair hanging out of their burqa. There was sort of a silence on the streets because people were terrified, always. As a woman, I was able to sort of travel around with my cameras hidden in my bag. I was able to meet with women in their homes and photograph them in secret. I was able to go into girls' schools and see girls being taught in the villages and basements and wherever any sort of brave Afghan family could hide a school inside their home. I fast forward to all the sort of subsequent trips I've made in the last 20 years where I essentially watched Afghan women blossom. And it was incredibly brave of them because Afghanistan is very conservative and, and it's to great offense to some more conservative men who don't believe that women should be out there. Obviously, no one expected the Taliban to, um, to come back so quickly. Um, and suddenly all of these women who have spent the last 20 years finding their voice, defining themselves uh, as women and as Afghans, um, are terrified. They are scared to go on the streets. If you look at all of the images coming out of Afghanistan over the last two days, you have to look very hard to find one or two women out in public. All they can think about is retaliation for the fact that they have been independent and they've been out and they've been working and doing all of these things that were forbidden under the Taliban.
if any of you are interested, you can watch the full interview on my Instagram account. Just go to Katie Couric or go to our website at katiecouric.com where we have all kinds of content. Meanwhile, I'm really thrilled to have a conversation today with Ambassador Milan Bevere. She is co-founder of Seneca Women and executive director of Georgetown University's Institute for Women, Peace and Security. Um, Milan, it's always great to see you. You and I have crossed paths many, many times over the last several decades, <laughs> I have to admit. Why don't you begin by telling us about your role and the kinds of things that you've done in government over the past several years? Well, Katie, it's always delightful to be with you. And it has indeed been at least a couple of decades since we first became acquainted and have been working together. And I can't thank you enough uh, for all that you're doing to illuminate illuminate these issues in so many ways. But when I was named uh, the first United States ambassador for global women's issues, it was based on the recognition uh, that where women's rights are protected and where women have opportunity, those places, those nations are far more prosperous. Uh, they are far more peaceful. Uh, and indeed, the opposite of that is where women's rights are denied, where they are oppressed, uh, those are places mired in conflict, uh, mired in extremism. The well-being of women is absolutely critical. The well-being of women and the well-being of nations goes hand in hand. So it's a matter of our own national security. You know, people said an ambassador for women, why does the United States need one? Because in the end, it is about our own national security. It's also about economic health because when you have 51.3% of the population not contributing to the economy, that can be devastating. We have a plethora of data today, both from all those multilateral institutions like the United Nations and the World Bank to the companies. The reality is that women grow economies. Uh, they spend their money differently. Women entrepreneurs in small and medium-sized businesses have tremendous impacts. And we need to bear in mind how important that is. You know, sometimes as ambassador, when I would visit um, countries and meet with the leaders, uh, the leaders would say, well, it's so lovely to have you with us, um, but I'm very busy and I have this nice young woman on my staff who will be happy to talk to you. And I would often reply, you know, sir, um, I really wish I had the opportunity to talk to you because I'd like to talk to you about how you can grow your economy. And all of a sudden the whole conversation changed. And somehow the role of women in growing economies is not factored in in so many understandings where they need to be. We're gonna talk in a moment, Milan, about how companies and marketers can step in and why it's so critically important for them to help promote some of these issues in a moment. But first, I want to ask you about Afghanistan, because you have been so intimately involved in some of the rescue efforts that have been going on there, some of the refugee support programs that are so desperately needed now that so many have fled the country. Tell us about uh, why we need to care about girls and women in Afghanistan so far away and why it should matter to every American. You know, Katie, I've been thinking about how present Afghanistan feels to the United States, not just with our, our soldiers uh, who have done extraordinary work at great price, uh, but also the engagement of this country and our allies around the world in trying to build a better future there. So it's not a sanctuary uh, for terrorists. Afghanistan is a different place today in terms of the progress of women and men than it was back in those horrible, horrible times. What's happening is it's a time of great peril. There are clearly women who have been prominent, who've worked closely with the United States, uh, who need to get out uh, to safety. Uh, many of them are in the process of being evacuated. That evacuation has been extremely difficult. There have been images uh, in our news about just how difficult that's been. 
uh, but there are countless more uh, who really need to, to leave with their families uh, because they may not be alive tomorrow by virtue of who they are. And then when they come uh, to the United States, as many of them uh, will, we need to be welcoming. We need to be supportive of them. Uh, we need to take the talents that they've developed and enable them to remain connected to the millions who will be left behind in Afghanistan. All of that is going to take resources to be able to support them uh, in this moment of extraordinary need. It's a moment where we have to come together again, uh, the way we've always come together. Yes, it's in our interest to ensure uh, that they are protected now uh, and that they can contribute uh, in their resettlement uh, and hope for a better day for their country. You know, we started Katie Couric Media a few years ago, understanding that companies had tremendous power to shape a conversation and to, in fact, change the world. And we collaborate with global brands to do storytelling that addresses a lot of these issues, whether it's girls and women in Afghanistan or the importance of gender equality, access to feminine hygiene products. We've worked with P&G on a number of stories. And you know, as faith in institutions has declined steadily, companies and corporations are really starting to fill that void. And I can think of no, no one more sort of on the forefront of that than, than Mark Pritchard. What role do you see corporations, if you read the Edelman Trust Barometer or think about the business roundtable, you know, employees are demanding it, consumers are demanding it. People are, are expecting CEOs and marketers to care. You know, I'm so glad uh, you asked this question because when I think about some of the programming that you've done on Katie Couric Media, by putting that kind of lens, working with the companies, uh, a lot of the work you've done with P&G, for example, it's been exceptional in, in, in raising awareness and awareness leads to action. Um, you know, some years ago, my co-author and I, Kim Azzarelli, wrote a book called Fast Forward. And most of the stories in the book are about the private sector women and men in the private sector, people like Mark Pritchard, who uh, is exceptional in so many ways in his understanding um, through the efforts of P&G, for example, in We See Equal, because companies have power. Uh, and yes, it's about the bottom line, but it's also about the accompanying impact that comes with those actions. When the Sustainable Development Goals were promulgated by the United Nations, one of the goals recognizes the need to partner with corporations, the need to partner with the private sector. That would have been unheard of not that many years ago. The role of the Business Roundtable, the role of enlightened leadership within companies, the kind of path-breaking, trailblazing work that companies are doing, where would we be if a lot of that weren't taking place? As the World Economic Forum has told us, it's going to take another hundred years for gender parity at the rate we're going. That's unacceptable. We can't put off bringing the talent of half the population of the world into growing our economies. In order to accelerate progress, we really have to come together. And I think that the private sector is one of those extraordinary uh, uh, partners uh, in making this come to the kind of full fruition uh, we need to see. And such an untapped resource, as you said, because we've only hit the tip of the iceberg. Think of the storytelling and the issues that we could address and help people understand. You know, it saddens me as someone who's been a journalist for decades that the media ecosystem has become so bifurcated and so partisan, and it's often an engagement through enragement. And we need to figure out a way to help people come to a certain level of understanding and then address the issues and 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 do it in a in a collaborative way. And I think companies, if they put their, you know, plant the flag into certain issues, the benefits of 
taking an issue, standing behind it, caring about it, and driving progress on that issue. And that's the kind of things I know that you're trying to do, and those are the kinds of things I know that I'm trying to do um, by helping people, helping companies see the power and in spreading understanding and spreading the right messaging and making as naive and Pollyanna-ish as it sounds, the world a better place. You know, Katie, uh, you're absolutely right. And we've been doing a lot of research looking at where are those great impediments to women's progress. And really one of the most fundamental problems uh, are norms, mindsets, biases, conscious or unconscious. Uh, those factors that see women's progress as a zero sum game. If she makes progress, I'm set back. And it's just the opposite of that. Where women progress, we all progress together. Uh, and this is where I think the kind of engagement that so many companies are involved in through their marketing to get rid of those stereotypes that are so harmful and, and to be parties to that creative and innovative way of really characterizing women to see her as she really is. Now, one of the things we set ourselves to do at, at Seneca Women, the name goes back to Seneca Falls and the right. early efforts in this country for women's rights, you know, over 150 years ago. And we're still on that road. Um, but we have a, a podcast network and our whole goal is to amplify women's voices, uh, established women, emerging women, women in the marketplace. It is to say that when these voices can be lifted up, as we all work together to lift up the voices of those women in Afghanistan who were on the front lines of change in their country, we all benefit and it's what our world so desperately needs. Uh, and that's why I think what See Her represents is so critically important because the aggregate of the power that this community has, this is one of the big solutions that can make an incredible difference. You know, we should also mention just, and I don't want this to be a footnote, but obviously with the, the in reckoning we've had uh, on, on social justice and, and race in this country, that women of color uh, need more support because they face even greater challenges in our world, certainly in our country. And that's something that I know See Her is also really focused on as well, to make sure that that population that has not had opportunities in the past has opportunities. And we work toward a more just society for those women um, who have too often been left behind. You're so right, Katie, this intersectionality, understanding that when we say women, Women are at different places. Women are experiencing in different ways. Some are being held back far more significantly. And we need to address all of those challenges. We are all in this together. Well, that's a great way to end this. And I'm so proud to be part of See Her, to be on the board of See Her. And we not only want to see her and understand the importance of how images shape per perception and opportunity, but we want to support her with companies that really care about these issues that see this not only as an opportunity, but a responsibility. So Milan, thank you so much for this conversation. It was really interesting and important. And speaking of see her, I am very proud to introduce the president of the organization, Janine Chow Collins. Good morning and welcome to the See Her Women in Sports panel. I am Stephanie McMahon, Chief Brand Officer of WWE. See Her started as an opportunity to represent the equal and accurate portrayal of women across advertising and has since expanded to include entertainment and now sports. I was incredibly proud to be a part of the initial meeting at Anheuser-Busch where we brought together media, brands, partners, athletes to really discuss the importance of equality and representation, especially across sports. And WWE, we had the opportunity to listen to our audience, 
and they demanded more from us in terms of how we represented our women, which has now led to a complete change in how we represent our women in our programming and has led to a match that happened in Abu Dhabi where there was a chant of this is hope and ultimately led to two women's matches in Saudi Arabia where the chant was simply this is awesome as it should be. That being said, Within the past year, there has been a 30% increase in social conversation about women's sports leagues. Female-focused sports ads are perceived as 148% more empowering than sports ads with men. And when the ad stars a female athlete as opposed to a male, it even increases the likelihood that that man will buy the product. Yet, a study from Purdue in 2019 showed that coverage of female athletes on television news and highlight shows, thanks top 10 sports reels, top 10 moments, is only 5.4%, 5.4%, which is obviously way too low. That needs to be 50% or greater, in my opinion. There's still so much further we have to go to achieve our collective mission. So with that, allow me to please introduce our esteemed panel. First, we have Janet Fletcher, Senior Brand Director Olympics and Sports Marketing from P&G. Janet started her marketing career in 2000 with roles spanning design of global product initiatives to leading marketing for P&G beauty brands. In 2009, she led the first P&G Vancouver Olympics program, which led to a 10-year partnership with the Interla International Olympic Committee. She is one of the original architects behind the award-winning Thank You Mom campaign. Andrea Fairchild, SVP Global Sponsorship Strategy, Visa. Andrea leads Visa's global sponsorships portfolio, including the Olympics and Paralympics, FIFA, and NFL. Visa is proud to be a long-standing supporter of the Olympic and Paralympic Games and the athletes who dedicate their lives to training to compete at the highest level of their sports. Laura Molin, President, Advertising and Partnerships, NBCU. Laura has strategic oversight of all advertising sales initiatives for NBCU's cable, Hispanic news networks, as well as digital partnerships, including NBCU's premier digital platform, Peacock. Laura is a passionate advocate for the accurate portrayal of women and girls in all media and has done significant work around the ANA See Her initiative since its original launch five years ago. And last but not least, we have Katrina Gallis, who is Women's Sports Strategy Consultant in Common Consulting. Katrina is the founder of In Common Consulting, a consulting firm that focuses on advancing women's sports across the entire sports ecosystem. Katrina's recent work with the Women's Sports Foundation helped to advance the Equity Project and their Equality Can't Wait initiative, and more recently, WSF's partnership with Sports Innovation Lab for the FAN Project. Her past experience in the sports industry and personal experience as a multi-sport athlete have enabled her to carry out WF's mission, WSF's mission to enable all girls and women to reach their full potential in sports and in life. So first, we're gonna start off and welcome everybody with Janet. Janet, P&G is known for its bold and inspiring inclusive campaigns like your Lead With Love campaign or the aforementioned unforgettable Thank You Mom campaign. This year's campaign is a little bit different. It's called Your Goodness In Your Greatness. Before I ask you about the strategy and the slight pivot with this, let's take a look. Your whole life, you've done things I could have never imagined doing. Things almost no one in the world can do. But I'm proud of you for something else. I'm proud of you for doing the things that we could all be doing. The things you do, not for yourself, well, look at that. but for others the things you do every day. Things that matter. The impact you have on the world around you. And I can't wait to see what you do next.
Janet, why is this such an important mission to share with, with during the Olympics with the audience? Why did you make this pivot? Oh my gosh, uh, the Tokyo 2020 Olympics, right? A games like no other. Um, <laughs> when we were delayed a year, uh, it took us a while to figure out what should we talk about? How should we communicate to still stay relevant with COVID and everything that was happening? So we went back and actually um, the sources of our inspiration have stayed pretty consistent. It's our athletes and our families that we go to to seek that advice. And when we checked in with all of our athletes, um, we were so inspired. Not only the fact that their dreams were postponed did not leave them sulking. They were doing things above and beyond sports, making changes in the world. Allison Felix talking about maternal health of African-American women. Elena Deladon's foundation still supporting people with special needs. Carissa Moore trying to encourage girls to be surfing. They didn't sit still. And it was so inspiring to see all the good that they were doing in their community. When you then couple that with the second source of inspiration, which is their parents, um, I'll just give one example. Marlene Felix and I, Allison's mom, met back in London 2012. And we've stayed to get, we've stayed in touch over the years. And I would talk to her and I'd say, aren't you so proud of Allison's golds and medals and things like that? And she said, I'm very happy about that, but I'll tell you, I'm more happy with the woman that she's becoming. I'm more happy that she's finding her voice, that she's a good mother, that she wants to help the world. And that's what she was most proud of. And as a mother of three, that insight that as parents, the biggest accomplishment we can have is to raise good kids who do good things in the world. Everything else is gravy, but just raising good kids. So that was a bit of the pivot that we did around this piece of your goodness is your greatness, acknowledging that the good things that people do are great, um, inspired by the athlete's story. So it's so telling. Our world needs so much help right now. We That's a whole different panel. Um, but that was the inspiration behind that film. Fantastic. And, and Andrea, I'm, I'm going to pivot a little bit here because uh, Janet was just talking about Allison and the mental health and the strength of all of these athletes and the mental health that they had to have to get through um, the COVID time periods, everything else, let alone compete. One of your most prominent athletes is Simone Biles. So what was it like behind the scenes and your decision making to continue to support Simone as she was going through her own mental health struggles? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the, the biggest moments was when Simone decided to withdraw from group comp competition. And it was absolutely heartbreaking to learn what she was going through, but her decision was inspiring and it was extremely brave. So, you know, we as a sponsor of both the games and Simone knew that it was incredibly important that we make it known that we fully supported her. And, you know, what is the Olympic community if we don't stand with one another at, you know, our lows just as much as we do our highs? What's most important is, you know, just uplifting one another when they need it the most and celebrate each other, even when it's kind of the, the most deserving at that time. It was such a unique um, situation, you know, and I think what was important along the way was just, you know, listening to her, listening to the voice of the athlete. We spent a lot of time with her team understanding kind of her personal journey at that moment and what would be the best way to show support and, you know, in, in being, you know, her, her partner, she has always been just a huge source of inspiration for fans everywhere, kind of doing what no athlete has never done before on the mat. And, you know, we just um, wanted to ensure the world understood that while she was this, you know, spectacle, that what she could all teach us outside of the gym was far more powerful. And that message deserved the spotlight. You know, these athletes, they own and respect the appreciation for who they are as humans, first and foremost, and um, kind of the global athlete sensation comes next. 
And, and speaking of uh, Visa's endorsement, this year you had your most diverse talent roster to date. Um, can you speak a little bit more about how Visa determines what athletes to support and endorse, not only around the Olympics, but in general? And also then, you've already spoken about the power of the athletes' voices, but then how did that give rise to your campaign? Yeah, absolutely. So since kind of the inception of uh, Team Visa, which started in 2000, we have made it our mission that 54% or higher of um, those athletes are women. In um, the recent Tokyo Games, we added 41 additions to the Olympic and Paralympic um, movement on Team Visa. And totally, we've recognized over 494 athletes that embody Visa's core values and really demonstrate that athletic excellence in, in sport. And to your question, you know, we recognize the power of the athletes and their selection, and we really aim to kind of align that with our brand. And, you know, we want to make sure that they represent those core values that we have of access, equality, and inclusion. And we feel like it's never been more important than today to kind of feel that connection. And we want to make sure that they're supported and then also how that is uplifting others. So we, we want to make sure that they really personify the Visa brand, just as I mentioned, those values and behaviors. It's also important to understand, you know, that, that the athletes within Team Visa can deliver kind of powerful and inspirational storytelling opportunities for us from a brand perspective, that they really create kind of this, um, you know, break through and extend our reach and our cultural connection. And then that they they validate our commitment. You know, we have such a longstanding commitment to the Olympic and Paralympic movement that they really validate and, and embody that. So those are the things that are important to us as it relates to, um, you know, selection process within, um, within our team visa roster. And um, given all of that, I would love to, at this point, throw to Visa's campaign this year called Making It. What does it take to make it? In the race to succeed, does somebody always have to fail? We've got to start lifting each other up and give everybody a fair shot. Because when that happens, we've all made it. These campaigns are so incredibly powerful. It's, it's hard not to react emotionally when you see them. Such critical messaging. So grateful to all of you for that. Um, Katrina, I'm, I'm actually going to throw to you now for some of the stats to really back up you know, the power of brands supporting athletes, supporting equality and diversity across all of these different platforms. So you've been instrumental in the Women's Sports Foundation's Equity Project, the Sports Innovation Lab's The Fan Project, and both studies have published really impactful data demonstrating the opportunity to invest and grow women's sports. Uh, we actually understand there's been a growth of over 12 times in fans of women's sports by engaging athlete-driven media across all different platforms in the past five years. So can you speak a little bit more to those statistics and for those listening and watching why it is so important and how it does help grow not only all of us as human beings, but of course, our businesses? Yes, definitely. And Stephanie, you mentioned a lot of great statistics up off the top here. And I think that uh, I'm definitely a, a stakeholder as we all are in the fan project, the equity project, and all the other amazing research that's being done across the industry. And so I just like to acknowledge all of the entities that are prioritizing that and actually wanting to learn more to advance this industry. I'd love to touch quickly on four different components of the women's sports ecosystem. So first of all, female athletes. So recently at Tokyo 2020, we saw Team USA, actually, the, the medals um, were, were won by um, a majority of women. So 58% of those 113 medals were won by women, which is quite amazing. And uh, just I know there's a lot of international people listening in today. And so I also wanted to uh, acknowledge that for Team Canada, it was actually a little bit higher at 75%. And so this is definitely a trend to watch around the world. And I think it, those percentages are only going to grow. 
When we look at female fans, Nielsen did an amazing report back in 2018, um, pointing towards the fact that 84% of sport fans, and now more than half of those were actually men, are interested in women's sports. And so implications of that are, um, you know, we're seeing just women's sports invest in different navigational tools for fans to tune in more quickly. Uh, CONCACAFW is building out a whole community around their women's soccer um, events. It, it's definitely um, being acknowledged that people want to watch these events. Uh, with regards to women's sports in general, the Women's Sports Foundation's Chasing Equity Project looked a little bit further into Title IX and, and the knowledge and compliance uh, still remains low across the NCAA, just under 90% actually. So there's still room for improvement there, especially as we approach the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And then finally, women in sports. That's both leaders, as all of us are on the call today, listening in as well, and then participants, people who, who are active uh, in their daily life. And so looking at the IOC gender portrayal guidelines, this is a key resource that's being created um, to help organizations really be intentional about the decision-making uh, that they are that they're that they're doing around women's sports and their investments in it and then from particip participation standpoint project play has done extensive research on youth sports and a safe return to sport so a lot of key data to to help us along the way and, and speaking of data laura um coming to you now and time supporter of see her we've seen many different representations of that across the olympics and all other forms of media can you share any key highlights and learnings out of this year's olympics in particular and of course the paralympics sure thank you so much uh so much of what katrina janet and andrea shared is what we are seeing the stories of the women uh, the journey that they're taking. And we're seeing other women celebrating these female athletes. Over two thirds of the social conversation on Facebook was women celebrating the female athletes. And uh, seven of the top 10 athletes talked the most about were the female athletes. We dedicated almost 60% of our hours um, in, in Tokyo to female sports. And we see even more of that in the, in the future. The fans are so passionate and their stories are ones that people can just gather around, celebrate and really cheer on these, these athletes. And as Katrina mentioned, uh, six, the women won 58% of the medals, 66 medals, which would have placed the, women, the U.S. women alone as the fourth largest country to win medals. So uh, female sports, she mentions, Katrina mentioned NCAA, uh, the U.S. women's basketball holds their reign as champions with a, with a, I think it's 55 winning game streak. So our, we see our fans, they want to celebrate, they're cheering on, they're talking about it on social, watching across all platforms, and the stories really just keep them so motivated to focus on these fans, on these athletes. So Laura, I'm just going to go to something personal here because you've been invested in every different way possible, and Gigi is currently your daughter is currently um, working for See Her and recently wrote a blog. Can you please share a, a little bit about, you know, your perspective as a mother of daughters and, you know, how excited you are about what she's doing? Sure, thank you. Um, my daughter actually was given a See Her internship. She applied, we were speaking on the Women in Media Committee and we were talking about how to get the perspective of the younger females, we really needed to have them telling us what they were seeing, what they were thinking. And thus they brought in some younger interns. Gigi is an athlete. She plays lacrosse and volleyball. And she just shared how confidence is so important, not only for herself, but to give it to other women. 
And I, I think it's just such a great theme to see women celebrating other women, giving each other confidence. And you see this in, in team sports. I read something recently that it's two thirds of all women in the C-suite played sports. And so mm -hmm. just having that camaraderie of, of, of cheering on another person only lifts you up. And that's what Gigi shared in her blog. And, and we, we see that in the Olympics all the time. I mean, you know, we saw it with soccer team, the volleyball team winning their, their first Olympic gold. So, so many unbelievable chances to cheer on each other, other women in, in respective sports. And that's what Gigi shared inspires her the most is to be able to cheer on her, her peers. Uh, she goes to an all girls school and and so it, it's just it's a common theme to support and give confidence to other women and andrea um i, I wanted to ask you about that in, intentionality and taking a stand especially as a brand so in 2019 visa announced that they would support the u.s women's national team at an equal level to the men's team and since then mm -hmm. you've seen positive brand affinity and engagement how has your sponsorship model evolved over the years? But most importantly, what is the importance of taking a stand like that? Um, it, it was such a bold and brave move. Yeah, and shouldn't absolutely. have been necessarily, but it but it was at the time, and and a, and a true yeah. first mover. Yes, absolutely. But I think that's what you know. It 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 was such a positive impact, right? And I'm so proud of um, you know of, of being able to. To do that, as you mentioned in 2019, you know we we did we made that commitment to elevate our sponsorships, and that was also part of the transformation. And you know, and move forward as a brand that's kind of shifting that paradigm of overall gender inequality in sports and really beyond. And you know, we also made the commitment that a significant portion of Visa's marketing spend is now intentionally focused on amplifying the message of gender equality investing in women's athletes through team and individual support on and off the field, um, you know, including the example that was given around uh, FIFA's um, Women's World Cup. We now proudly sponsor, we've added 18 female football, footballers to the Team Visa roster. And, you know, again, we couldn't be more proud of the impact that that has made. With that said, you know, Visa has always stood for really making a transformational impact. That's what has you know the the brand has always stood for. And it's not about simply putting your logo up on venues anymore. It's really about supporting local communities, how you're empowering others, empowering small business owners for us, and advancing opportunities for those underrepresented underrepresented groups. And you know, I think everyone knows this, like brand purpose really represents why a company exists and all brands should be able to identify that why. And at Visa, when we did evolve our sponsorships so that our business priorities and our brand purpose strategy better aligned, you know, it, it gave us a purpose and our purpose is to connect the world. And, you know, then how that manifests itself is a perfect example in um, in women's sports. And we want to ensure that, you know, we are uplifting, we are helping others to, to, to thrive along the way. And today, I think just with everything that we're talking about as well, it's never been more important for brands, especially to have that connection you know, supporting others and really helping to uplift, uplift those communities. I love it. And uh, to bring us home, I'm coming back to you, Janet, um, especially around P&G's most recent campaign. Here we have a panel of all women uh, supporting this incredible movement. And I think you, you've heard from all of us, but I think we need to watch this, this video, this campaign that's entitled, Just Watch Me. Will you watch me? Will you fill up the bleachers? Show up and watch me? Don't let me drop out. Show me your support. Turn out the crowds. Watch me today so I know there's a place for me tomorrow. Just watch me. Janet, can you please quickly share a, a little bit of the strategy behind this and, and, and really bring this panel home? 
as a marketing person, when you find a statistic or a fact that is just so provocative, it becomes the creative gem from which you can build a message. And the statistic that was um, shared in the uh, copy was by age 14, the drop, girls drop out of sports twice the rate of boys. And we all believe and know what sports gives us, right? So what I thought was really interesting though, is it's not anyone else's problem. We, the call to action in, in, in this film says, we can help turn that around. We are the fans that can fill the stands. We are the marketers that can invest in athletes, female athletes. We are the sponsors that can support with our media investments where to play. Um, the call to action is a mobilizing call to watch her and help help the next generation of girls become powerful women. So I love it. <laughs> Great message. Oh, well, my goodness. I, I think you just said it best. We are the fans. We are the marketers. We are the sponsors. We are the ones who are going to make a difference collectively. All of you watching, all of us behind the scenes, all of us in front of the camera, Together, only together, can we actually make this impact and change. And I think just a few key takeaways is the purpose, the why of your brand and what you're trying to accomplish, the intentionality. Uh, you, you heard from various speakers today talking about the intention of representing 54% uh, of athletes being women or 60% of NBCU's coverage of the Olympic sports being for female sports. Um, it's being intentional, it's being bold, it's being brave, it's investing in one another. Uh, so thank you very much for watching today. Um, you can go to seeher.com to learn more. And now we're looking forward to Chris Guilfoyle, the EVP of membership. Hi, uh, Janine Chow Collins, president of SeeHer. Um, welcome everybody from the Global Day of Learning. I hope you enjoyed that peek into the SeeHer member meeting. Uh, to get the full member meeting, please go to the Global Day of Learning's on-demand portion and you'll see Telemundo, TikTok, SeeHer, HearHer, our music task force, and so much more amazing content. And we hope all of you believe in our mission to uh, advance the accurate portrayal of women and girls in media, advertising, content, and entertainment. And if so, please go to seeherinfo.com uh, to get more information and potentially join. And uh, once again, we're so thrilled to be part of this Global Day of Learning. It's been amazing. Thank you.